All right, and we are live. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. This is Jamie Green, and um, I'm presenting uh, a roundtable tonight, a uh, Ruth and Naomi roundtable sponsored by our Marketplace Ministry. And I have some amazing women that are joining me tonight. I call them my Naomi um, because those of you who are familiar with the story of Ruth and Naomi in the Bible and those who are not, let me just give you a little bit of background that these ladies are characters in the Bible, in the book of Ruth, okay? And uh, Ruth was a young lady um, who followed Naomi um, because of her wisdom and her insight. And she trusted Naomi so much that she said, your God will be my God. And so I have gathered together tonight some women who I have absolute faith and confidence in. Um, when many of them I go to for advice and insight. Some of them, you know, taught me off the ledge when necessary. Um, and so I just wanted to bring them to you tonight to share what they have in them that they can pour into you. Please feel free to um, ask any questions. Hold on one second, let me make this uh, available to everybody. Feel free to ask any questions that you have for any of our panelists on the round table, and I'm sure they will be more than happy to um, answer your question. All right, first, I'd like to thank my guest tonight for joining me. Um, I just believe that what you have inside of you is needed and necessary by so many other young women that are coming behind us. I think we have a responsibility to pour into them and to give them some guidance and wisdom. We often hear people complaining about them, about some of our young women and you know some of the choices and decisions that they make, but we don't have very many people taking time to pour into them. And so this is what this is about tonight. All right, so I think I will start with Miss Lori Carter. And Lori um, recently retired after 37 years of service to Wicomico County uh, in the state of Maryland as a director of planning, zoning, and community development. So congratulations, Lori. Uh, first, before we get into the questions, tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Wow. Okay, well, a little bit about myself is, um, first of all, I am um, someone who loves the Lord, um, and I've been uh, someone that has been very involved with ministry most of my life. Um, besides that, as you just have mentioned, um, I just am a recently retiree, um, and I am enjoying every moment of it. I'm still having a little issue navigating the time. Um, still getting up early. Um, and I've talked to many of my colleagues who have retired who said within time, you know, it does get better. Um, but I am enjoying the ride. I have definitely taken advantage of the last two weeks. I've actually retired on August the 30th. And uh, so I'm just getting accustomed to it. Um, in the meantime, I'm um, served as the director um, by profession. I am a planner. Um, I still will continue to be working in some areas of that. Um, but also, I serve as the CEO and founder of Solomon's Financial Solutions. I've had that particular company now for 22 years. Um, I was always taught, no matter what, no matter what career path you take, make sure you have an egg <laughs> in a basket or a basket that you can put eggs in. So I have definitely been on the entrepreneurial journey for some time. I love the beach. I love to, I love to read. I love to spend time cooking. And I know a lot of people find that to be very, very surprised when I tell them I love to cook. They're like, oh, you do? Um, I don't know why. I don't know because I'm single and they just think that's something that, you know, single people just don't do. Uh, but I do love to cook. That's like one of my pastimes and spending time outside cutting the lawn or just doing the flowers. So 
I enjoy life. And uh, that's just a little bit about me. Awesome. All right. So let's go ahead and introduce each everyone. Then we'll get into the nitty gritty of the question. How about you, Miss Lisa? Tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm going to unmute myself because that would make for a better conversation if I could be heard. I'm, I'm just saying good evening. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, James Cena, for having me tonight. So my name is Lisa Ann Alexander, and I do lots of things. Um, <laughs> James Cena will tell you. So I have a media company called This Woman Knows Media. That's where we share stories so um, people can evolve into the best versions of themselves. And we do that by learning from each other. So if you can save me from a pothole up the way, then we share those stories so that we can all grow and evolve. Um, we do podcasts, there's um, a magazine there, there's blog posts, there's premium web content. And so that's my baby. It's based on a book that I wrote 13 years ago called This Woman Knows. Um, I'm also a filmmaker. I've done documentaries for nonprofits. I'm working on a feature film that's a whole process. Um, I'm an avid gardener. I've been married to the same man. Let me rephrase that. I've been happily married to the same man for 36 years. Has all 36 years been happy? Probably not, you know, because we get on each other's nerves at times, but we're content, still love each other and um, happy to be his bride, happy, still happy to be his wife. Um, we have two adult children, two dogs, um, I did say that I love to garden. We have um, a garden and I call it Alexander Farm and Orchard. It's my backyard garden. Um, <laughs> I enjoy growing our own food. Um, I enjoy yoga. That has been a lifesaver for me and dealing with traumas and healing and that whole process. Yoga has been a godsend for me. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, just happy to be a creative soul to be able to do these things that God has gifted me to do. So that's who I am. And I look forward to sharing with you all tonight. Thank you, Miss Lisa. You all can tell those of you who are listening in and those of you that will be listening in the replay, you can tell that I'm connected to some amazing women. And um, they, you know, even when I get in my little, whatever you call it, where I just don't feel like doing anything or whatever, they don't let me stay there long. Um, I'll either get a text from somebody uh, email from somebody, a call, or whatever. And I just love each and every one of these women. Dr. Brown, I'm going to save you for last. All right, Miss Kathy, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Jamie, for having me tonight. I um, am Kathy McKnight. I am founder of Bound for Better, domestic violence advocates for uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, I had it for almost 11 years now. I love yoga um, as well. My daughter's a specialist, a therapist, a specialist. So I make sure I get my yoga in from her every Sunday. And um, I work during the day as well, besides my, uh, which I'm a PO. And then I have my, like I said, my own nonprofit. And then I work on the weekends as a behavior specialist. My husband has been deceased. I am moving forward with learning to travel more, um, just learning more self-care pieces. I do have a podcast myself you know, uh, called Your Voice, um, which is now a little over a year. So thankfully, I'm finding myself moving forward to do things, you know, after he has passed on and just learning to love myself more through the trauma and stuff that I've been through as well. And just being thankful to be on this platform with such like-minded women that I see the determination and the strength. And thank you, Jamie, for continuing on with doing what you're supposed to be doing and not giving up. So thank you again. Thank you, Miss Kathy. Love you. All right, Dr. Brown. She's she got to come with this powerful, uh, I don't know. I'm not going to pick on you tonight. <laughs> Dr. You're going to pick. That's Hello. Why I'm up because she's one of those people like um, when I have a question, especially about a scripture or, you know, a biblical text, and I ask her and she comes back with this information. I'm like thinking, what? Where did you find that out? Like, I've been, I've been reading this scripture forever since Jesus was a baby. And I didn't see that in there. How did you get that? But I just, I just love it. All right, Dr. Brown. That's a little bit about you. 
Hello, I am Dr. Yvanda Brown. Um, I am um, a pastor and have been pastoring for 23 years. Um, I also have my own business, um, Shiva, and Shiva means giver of life. So I am a transformational coach as well. Um, I've gone through a lot of trauma in my life, and I truly believe that that trauma um, is what caused me to become triumph. Um, so I took my wounds and turned them into wisdom. I took my drama and I turned it into deliverance. So I truly believe that it was good that I had been afflicted. Um, that no matter what I face, no matter what, what has come my way, I have learned to transform. And in transforming, it it just taught me um, that I was trapped within myself and I suffered from solipsium, which is uh, a lack of self-awareness. So in identifying who I am, learning who I am, what I like, what I don't like, what I will accept, what I won't accept, it's caused me to blossom into the person that I, that I am today. And I absolutely love this version of me. <laughs> thank you so much. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And it, uh, I want to take a moment and thank those of you who are watching. Um, like I said, feel free. If you have any questions, uh, you can put them in the comment section. And I'll make sure that the ladies respond. And thank you so much, Makai Purnell, for joining us. When I thought of, um, us that are on the panel on the, in this round table as the Naomi's in the story. And I thought about the roots that we want to pour into and guide and lead with our wisdom. Makai Purnell is one of the very first young women that I thought of. And I am just so happy to see um, you on here today. And I know that there's going to be something said that will bless you and move you forward even as you're doing what you're doing in that awesome work that you're doing with your nonprofit as well. All right, so let's get started. Let's start with uh, Lori. As I said, you recently retired and um, while you were working, I know you were extremely uh, involved in city and county um, issues, right? And so that introduced you to and brought you in uh, contact with a whole bunch of diverse people. And one of the things that we as women have to learn um, is to, is to, uh, to be ourselves, maintain our individuality, yet be able to interact with other people that may have different beliefs, different values, different morals or what have you. What are a couple of the coping strategies that you, Lori, incorporated um, to help maintain a positive mental health all these years. Well, there are a couple, but I had learned, I mean, starting uh, the profession that I did at the very tender age of 23, uh, when I first um, relocated here, um, it was very different, even though this is my mother's hometown. Um, still, we lived in um, Philly for a while, and then my parents relocated um, to my father's hometown, which is in Queen Anne's County. And then I uh, moved to um, the Baltimore. And so coming back here, even though I was here, like I said, I was kind of here a lot in the summer time. Um, I kind of knew some, but there were a lot of folk that didn't know me now on the level. They just knew me as the kid who came down every summer because my parents packaged me up and they sent my siblings and I here every summer to be with our grandparents. So um, when I got into my field, one, it is a male dominant field straight out the gate. I went to school originally to be an architect and then I changed majors um, in my junior year into urban planning. And being in a male predominantly um, work force um, and also a field. And then when you put being on the Eastern shore on top of it, 
Um, there was many originally challenges, but I saw them now as I grew as opportunities. So I had to learn immediately being in a very diverse community, but yet not very mentally diverse. And I hope you understand what I'm saying um, in regards to that. Um, yeah. I had to do a lot of walks. I took walks. Um, there was many who had the smoker breaks. I took my walks. I went and I talked to my supervisor. I said, look, everybody else can get out and do their smoke. Um, I need to take mental walks. And they kind of looked at me at first like it's not that serious, but it was very serious because I was dealing with a lot of things at the time. Um, so it is very um, important that you set aside time when you know that you need, you are your best clock. The same way that we set an alarm clock for everything else, we need to set alarms for ourselves. We know when we are being triggered or tired or whatever the case may be, and we have to set aside those moments. We have to make dates with ourselves in order for us to be our best self. And so that was something that I learned from a mentor or many, many years ago who walked in the same steps that I did. Um, and I had to make sure that I took those breaks. I had to have a good personal board of directors. Um, because again, I was, I was in a field that was male predominantly. And again, on the shore, coming in as a person of color and a woman, and you're dealing with the greatest asset that anyone has, and that's their land, their property. And you're telling people how to best manage that or what they can and what they cannot do with that. So yeah. it was very important for me to have strong people that I could be able to go to, to also get um, the necessary guidance that I needed. But I was definitely quiet walks makes a big difference. So I started there with just the walks. Yeah. I love that because uh, like you said, it is so important. Like we get caught up as women of, you know, entrepreneurs, business women, wives, mothers, grandmothers, you know, we get so used to, you know, just employees. We get so used to just, you know, doing what everybody else needs from us. We used to give and give and giving of ourselves. And then we hear people talk about, you know, you can't really pour from an empty cup. So what I'm hearing you say and what I want, you know, those who are listening to understand, it is important for you to recognize when you need to worry about you, when you need to take care of you and you need to do what you need to do to replace, restore yourself back to the place where you need to be. Thank you so much for that, Lori. All right, Ms. Lisa. You're next up. Yes, ma'am. All right. So I want you to talk about social issues and advocacy, right? And as an advocate and a voice, um, I understand the importance of speaking for others <clears throat> that, and I stopped saying that don't have a voice because actually everybody has a voice. Some people just don't mm -hmm. know how to use it. And they have to be, you know, shown how to use it. But as an advocate for transparency with regard to gender equality and respect, share your um, views as to why these things are so important. So the late um, Senator um, John Lewis, he said, basically paraphrased, if you're going to get into any trouble, get into good trouble. And so I believe in getting 10 toes deep into good trouble and what is good trouble? Um, there are lots of ways you could define it. You know, John Lewis, he said that um, anything uh, uh, centered around voting, making sure that voter rights were protected, that was good trouble. If you go to your text, it would say that taking care of the widow or the orphan, that's good trouble, right? And so I believe it is amplifying, to your point, amplifying the voices of those in marginalized communities or those who have difficulty getting their voices heard, right? It's not that they're without a voice, it's the amplification of that voice, right? And so I truly believe that 
we can all amplify to some level to to some extent that we can all help or take part of those issues that mean the most to you or that you know weigh on your heart so we've got a lot of things happening in the world right now lots of things happening there are lots of people in need there are lots of um issues that you can take up and that you should speak up for that you should lend your finances your hand if you if you can't get involved if you can't go march if you can't go protest but you can write a check then write the check right? right so there 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 are so many ways that we can help and advocate for those in need so i'd um in one of my businesses pretty work creative what we did is we advocated we well, we helped amplify the voices of nonprofits right so i learned so much by working with nonprofits and learned that there are so many different causes and people with so many different issues things that i had never heard of i did a documentary a short documentary for an organization that worked with kiddos who were in the juvenile um, detention system and that were also in the in CPS, what we call CPS here, Child Protective Services, two of the most broken systems that any soul could find themselves in. And they have a saying that is like nothing for us without us. So how are yeah. you going to advocate for us? And it's like we're not included in that process. So there's this. Um, savior mentality that tends that tends to happen you know where people will come in and they want to be the savior and they they're no normally don't kind of look like us that may lack a little melanin the savior complex and i remember one of my clients saying it's like we do not want a savior complex come uh, depicted at all in any of the work that we produce it's like got gotcha. you because these are still people at the end of the day these are still um, people's lives and they want to raise their kids. And it's like, when you, it's like, we all really want the same thing. It's like live in peace, raise our yeah. families, make some, make a little money, um, not be, not to be too, too terribly stressed. And so said that all to say, so wherever you can, if you have capacity, cause here's what I know. And I talk to James Cena about this all the time. Not everybody has capacity. Not everybody has capacity. Um, whether to give, they don't have the time, don't have the resources, they will probably be the people that need to, to receive such kindness, right? So if you have capacity, if you can sleep well at night and, you know, not in fear of your life and, you know, the fridge is full, those kinds of things, um, it's a way to give back. It is definitely a way to give back. I think, I can't remember who the um, author of the statement was, but it's like um, service is the rent that we pay to live here. It's the service we pay. And I think we owe that to our fellow human beings, right? It's like if there, if we can, if we can be of service, then do, there's a phrase going around. It's like, do something. And I'll leave it right there. Do something. If you Absolutely. see something, do something. Many years ago, I saw this movie, and don't laugh at me, y'all, but it's, it, I guess it's supposed to be a kid's movie, right? And it's called Robot. And, <laughs> and so basically the story was about, there was a place where all broken robots ended up when they decided that you were no longer of value because you, know, you have one leg or one eye or whatever the case may be. And so there was this young, guy a little boy robot who decided he wanted to fix these broken robots and he said something in that movie that's has stuck with me for years he said when you see a need you meet a need so whether it's important to anybody else or not if you see there's something you can do i encourage you to do it now lisa i want you to just briefly share um a little bit about your indie film because you know me, I'm all, I'm all about provoking controversy. It's like- um, Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are. Yeah, did you see me try to slide? I really did try to slide right past the film. I really did. I was trying to slide right past it. I wasn't trying to raise no no sand, Miss, Miss James Cena. Because if you, and those, there's one, two, two people on this, 
um, panel that knew my dad. And so when I'm always stirring up something, um, they know I can't help it because of who my dad was. But I want you, <laughs> I want you to talk just a little bit about your indie film and why you feel, um, while we're talking about social issues and activism, mm -hmm. why you felt it was necessary to do this film. All right, so I am <laughs> currently in um, pre-production for a feature film that I wrote, will direct, and it's called My Father, the Queen. I'll just let that sit for a minute. My Father, the Queen. The story is loosely based on my life and what it is, what it was to grow up with a man who had a secret and what that did to a whole family. And so it is a story not told frequently and especially from the daughter's perspective. So you hear about maybe the wives, you know, who share their stories about their down low husbands and sneaky, sneaky businesses, but from a daughter's perspective and what it is to experience a man who did not have the capacity to love you, to raise you in a way that was healthy, right? And how do you deal with that? And so the movie talks about what daddy issues are and how they manifest in a grown woman's life. And then finally, what healing looks like. And then the role of the church in all of this and how there, there it's <laughs> we I, I I spare no punches and I tell the story because it happened to real people. This isn't something that I made up. This is real life and what happened and how it how how this impacts real people and what if things could have been done differently. So we walk through this story of two sisters, um, their family, and this, this this poor man who was not able to live his truth and how that impacted his ability to love the family that he created, um, whether or not he wanted to, or it, this is based in the 60s, the 70s, 80s, current day. So we go, we step through some, um, some decades. And so we tell this story, my father, the queen. I thought it was important to share because I keep getting people in my DMs. I keep getting emails from women, from men who go, thank you for being brave enough to tell this story. Thank you because I see myself. I had, um, we did a fundraiser in Chicago um, in November of last year. And this beautiful man. He says, thank you for sharing your story because when you share your story, you share our story. And it's a way that we have a voice and we can be heard. I learned so much by writing the film and talking to people. Um, there is a such thing as called father guilt or daddy guilt. So we always talk about daddy issues. There is a such thing as daddy guilt. And it is of gay men back in a certain era, 60s, 70s, who could not live their truths and were forced to either, and I won't say forced, but made a decision to marry, have children, and then not be able to either be a part of those children's lives or just things didn't go well. So there is a such thing called daddy guilt. And I didn't know that and learned that from some very beautiful people. And so that kind of added color to the story that, um, Folk just want to, they want to be able to live and um, live their best lives. And so that's basically my father, the queen. We follow, we follow this family and we'll see what the end is going to be. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was not, absolutely not going to let you get away with that. Let me slide. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Because what are the things that I know as a black woman and as I know, as a black woman raised in the Christian church, um, and Lisa's mother was a, a pastor. I think she was a bishop also. Um, bishop Gwendolyn know, G.P. Mackey. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
Thank you very much for that little plug. But, um, but I, I know that in the church, there, there's a lot of uh, secrecy and hidden things that people deal with because of the shame, the guilt, the judgment, the, you know, back in the day that used to make you stand up in the church and tell all your business. Um, if you got caught doing something that you had no business doing, they didn't take you in the office to talk about it. You had to literally stand up in church and confess it. Um, and so there's a lot of shame and guilt that's been uh, programmed into our spirits. And this is one of the things that I want young people to understand, and especially young women. Um, your truth is your truth. Whatever happened, happened. What you did, you did. Whatever you need to be healed from, you need to be healed from. And there has to be someone and some place where you can go and be real and be healed. And these women that are sitting here tonight are women that I can be myself with. Like, you know, I'm, I'm having a bad day. I'm just ready to punch somebody in the throat. Um, and they'll be like, uh, no, that this is what we're going to do. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I'm discouraged. I'm depressed. And this next young lady um, that I'm going to have share, you know, ask some questions to. I met Kathy via Zoom. That's how I meet most people these days. Um, I attended a webinar about gun violence, I think it was. And she was uh, one of the guest speakers. And she shared her experience with domestic violence. And I immediately thought to myself, I have got to speak to this person. I really got, to, I need to connect with her. And I think it was a couple of years or so ago, I don't know. I'm not, I'm maybe the youngest one on the panel, but I have trouble remembering things. No, I'm just kidding. So <laughs> no comment from you, Lori. So I don't really know how long it is I've known Kathy, but there were times when I would become really frustrated with wanting to do things for a mother's cry, like give, uh, what is it, school supplies, even the thing we were doing where we would adopt the family for Christmas. And Kathy said to me, just give me the name of the, the, the family, the number of children in their ages, and my organization will help you with that. So each one of these women have poured into me, and that's why they're here tonight, because I know that they have something valuable that they can pour into you as well. So Kathy, why don't you um, prepare yourself to answer a few questions for me. You, um, you deal with, I, I have learned this from you, you're constantly learning and you're constantly getting more degrees and more certificates and you never stop learning. And I love that. So talk to us about the importance of education and lifelong learning. Why is that so important to you? To me, that's important because things are always changing. Um, you know, now I'm going to work on thinking on going back to get my PhD, but things are always changing, whether whatever field that we are, if, if the human behavior changes, the skills within our agency changes, you know, so it's to the point where we have to make sure we stay on top of it because they're going to keep coming us, at us anyway with new policies and procedures. You know, and I would say also education, it would it entails how much money we want to make, right? So you want to make sure you have the education that's needed in order to make more money. You know, that's what that's what the population is. That's what we always thinking of. So and that's what society is looking for. Um, what type of education do you have? What type of skills do you have? What can you bring to the table? How can you that suffice this person making sure that they're able to move forward in life and i would say that too with even with my domestic violence women um basically trying to get them going going back to school so that they can learn even just the smallest things like learn how to life skills or to write a check to pay the bills um so things are always evolving um I just tell them and I, uh, you know, because I wrote down a few things that I want them to know as well as finding success and how this is, what's the purpose? You're finding your purpose behind your success. Success. So I would say that that's how I got started with Bound for Better, the org my organization where we cater to women and children and now men of domestic violence and sexual assault. 
I want to make sure that they know, again, like the life skills, because it may not, um, at this point in time, just, it's just, just sa their safety and learning how to be able to maintain moving forward. Then we'll focus on the school, the resume writing or anything like that, any skills that they may have had before their incident. Um, you know, and what is this they're trying to do now? How can we assist them moving forward? And are they willing to try to go to school? Some of them don't even know how to fill an application. So we start with the basics of everything to make sure that they're at least able to do that and to get it, you know, to get that. Because like I said, the, um, it starts with the behaviors, our human behaviors, our skills. What is it that we know? What can we bring to the table? Things are always changing. So you know, and it's it's so funny. I heard one of the ladies say something about um going back. So I me, mean, uh, things are always changing, and going back to school. And I'm like, that's. I think it was you, Jamie. So it's like that was confirmation because I heard this still small voice in me go back to school. I'm like, oh no, I don't have time for that right now. I can't do it. I don't want to do it. You know. So my and it turns out just my uh, my counselor called me the day before yesterday. I had already received my master's like two years ago. And I'm like, I'll go when I'm ready. Just so happy she called me. I'm like, oh, Lord. This, and then for you to say that, as far as education, you give me this piece on education. I'm like, okay, somebody's trying to tell me something. So I do know what it is I have to do because, like I said, things are always changing. And even here, we all know in the state of Maryland, um, if that's where we are, um, the bills are changing um so i try to stay abreast on top of everything you know i have to learn and have to know what it is that the, this council member is talking about that one is talking about how can they help us out whether it's law enforcement or anything like that um just staying two steps ahead of them so that i can you know bring that to the surface of my clients so yeah I, i'm thankful that i had this piece right here because it touched me because it's like okay this is confirmation for me to start moving forward with my phd Awesome. I love that. I'm so proud of you. Um, and, and I was thinking about as you were talking, I have been um, a victim of domestic violence as well. It's not something that I talk about a lot, um, but I, I was involved in um, domestic violence situations. And I was thinking as you were talking about education and the importance, I think a lot of it could be, and you can you know, give me your opinion about this, is that we get so comfortable relying on this person to do stuff for us that we don't know how to do for ourselves. And we've been programmed to think, I don't need to learn how to get a job. I don't need to learn how to do this, that, and other, because this is my man got me. Right. And then one day your man got you like in your eye. But, but then you're kind of like out in a sea on an ocean floating with no no direction because you don't know how to you know take care of yourself how to take care of your children or whatever and i was thinking that it's so important even with the ladies that you work with i love that you don't just find them a place to spend uh the night or somewhere to get away from their abuser but you're also feeding their spirit and their minds as well as their bodies i appreciate that right and let me say this too jamie i heard you say um you know, yes, the, the the abuser will call him that, him or her that. The abuser will and tell that in you. Nobody wants you or you're stupid or you're not, you can't do this or anything. So she is programmed to think that way. Okay, if I go to school, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I don't know what I'm going to take. I can't afford it. So she's just going to be on the bottom level. And she's just going to feel like she needs to stay there because he has told her this. So my job is to get that counseling piece in there, educate her on things that needs to be just to survival, stand in survival mode, not for just for her, but just for her children also. Um, <clears throat> and basically let her know that we're there for her. And then we can start off with the basics and that's right in the resume. What type of job skills have you had? What have you done? Um, are you thinking about going back to school? I helped one go to um, PG County, uh, the community college to start back up, get out of her situation and just to start with something. Long as we know that, um, like I said, the basic human skills, uh, the human behaviors, everything, you know, is everybody always wants to go back because things are changing. The more uh, education I have, the more money I can make, you know. And now so it's almost like people are so thinking so much also that, okay, I don't need a degree. I can still make money. I can still do this. 
But over time, you know, I find myself now too I'm trying to learn Spanish because that's a that's a, that's a part too. Um, because most jobs require that you do, you know, you bilingual, you know, speak bilingual Spanish and English at the same time, different clients, population that you may serve, and also with my clients on domestic violence. So it's a lot, but you know, it's worth it. It's worth it in the end. You get that that satisfaction and doing what you want to do is the education piece and you'll find your purpose and your passion in doing it. Absolutely. I love that because what I've found is sometimes people say to me, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know why I'm here and I, I haven't figured it out yet. And I always say, start with your passion. What are you passionate about? What means something to you? Like, what do you think about when you first wake up in the morning? What are you thinking about all day? And what is kind of like the last thing you think about? What are you dreaming about? Start there, right? And then God will send somebody along to help you do whatever else you need to do. I love you, ladies. Wow, this is powerful. Don't forget, those of you who are listening, if you have any questions or comments for any of these wonderful ladies, feel free to write it down and um, I'll make sure that they uh, read them as well. All right, so now we're going to um, close out this portion with Dr. Yavanda Brown. And Dr. Yavanda Brown is going to talk to us um, for the topic philosophy and spirituality. And I'm going to say this I keep saying I'm going to stop picking on her, but I, you know, I can't help it. Like, I just feel like I have to pick on her. But um, it's not really picking on her. She loves it. But I say this all the time, those of you that know me that I was raised in the church, whatever, I have basic foundational teachings, right? But as I've gotten older and more mature and understood the importance, the difference between religiosity and relationship with my creator, I've become more open to understanding that that involves every aspect of my spiritual being, not just knowing Bible verses, um, you know, like, you know, some people like, you know, they can quote a scripture at the drop of a hat. You wake them up in the middle of the night, you start the scripture, they can finish it. All right. But they don't have any relationship with people or with God based on their attitudes and what have you. And that's why I think it's so important, not just be religious, but to have relationship. And that's one of the many things I love about Dr. Um, Brown is her ability to see beyond just religion, right? And so your ability, Dr. Brown, to see beyond religiosity into the spiritual element of our existence um, is one of the things I learned about you. I want you to explain to our daughters and to those gentlemen that are listening as well, why is it important for an individual to know their beliefs and their values, they have a clear understanding of what they believe and what they value and what me what it means to them spiritually. Why is that important? Um, it is vitally important to first know God. I don't not just know church, not just know um, bylaws. The church's bylaws. What does God say about this? Not just know the voice of the pastor or the voice of the bishop or the voice of the apostle. What does God's voice sound like to you? Do, do you even know the voice of God? Because his voice can speak to us in so many ways. I can remember one day I was coming back from Baltimore and I was like almost, I don't know, I was just, I was up by 404. For those of you who didn't know the Maryland area, I already came on the Eastern shore. So I was up by 404 and there was a road sign that said, thank you for your patience due to the construction. Well, I read that and just went out in the spirit drive and just, just God, I, I just went right in. Because I was already going through something and God, it was to me, God was like, thank you for your patience. Due to the construction, due to the things that I have going on in your life, 
Thank you for your patience. So God speaks in so many ways. It's not just from the building because we're the church. It's not just only from those four walls. I love nature. I love the water. I love, and I just recently found this out. I, I love digging in the dirt. I love grounding. And I didn't know, I, I used to think like, I, I'm not the digging dirt kind of girl, but I've come to learn. <laughs> I was pulling weeds and I found it so refreshing. And God was speaking to me while pulling weeds. Okay. So he speaks in so many ways. So that's why it's vitally important to have a relationship with him and not just be churchy. Not just to, I'm going to say in the, in the African-American church, shout means to just dance, 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 dance all night. No, that's not what the word shout means. It says shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It's from your mouth. There should be a ruah, R-U-W-A, ruah. That's a Greek word for noise. There should be a noise between us and God. There should be a praise. There should be uh, adoration. There should be exhortation. There should always be something between us and God. And not only is it all a shout in your feet, because I had to come to learn because early on, you know, back in the day, I was a shouter, just dance, 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 dance. Until I had to learn that that really wasn't getting me where I needed to be in him. So I had to establish a relationship and I had to learn to talk to God about my stuff because I had a lot of stuff and I was dancing over it and it wasn't going anywhere. I was dancing over it, but I was still depressed. I was dancing over it, but I was still withdrawn. I was dancing over it but I hadn't dealt with the fact that I was molested by a policeman. I was still dancing over it as an adult, but hadn't dealt with my childhood. So it's vitally important that we understand that having a relationship with God is so refreshing. I come to learn who I am by having a relationship with him and being able to talk about it and not just be religious, not just be carnal. Because there's a, there's a vast difference between a carnal Christian and a spiritual Christian. <laughs> and the truth of the matter is, might not be the right place to say this, but carnal people get on my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> carnal people it's, it's about people, places, and things well life is so much more than that if you're always talking about people and always you know your views and your opinions and that's all it is and you in competition no no learn to collaborate learn to elevate let's Let's talk about how we can get delivered and stay delivered. Let's talk about becoming whole in God. If I only, let's focus on religion and, and traditions, I'm going to be stuck. And it is evident. It's, it's written all over people's faces when they're stuck but they don't know it. And a lot of times the truth will hurt them because they're not ready for it. I can remember one time I was ministering to a lady and because I saw myself, she was just dancing, 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 shouting, 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 shouting. And I calmly went up to her. I wasn't loud on all in the mic. But I calmly went up to her and let her know, you can't dance over that pain. You have to face it. 
And she got mad at me. And I, I was fine with it. <laughs> but years later, she came back to tell me thank you because no one had ever told her that. So we must be honest with people. We first must be honest with ourselves so that we can be honest with others and know what it is to have a, a real relationship, not a falsehood, not heresy, not half truth, but to know what the full truth is. Wow. I was thinking about when you were talking, I think most of you on there on this panel uh, probably know this and some you may not, but in 95, I think it was, I was uh, admitted to a mental health unit and um, diagnosed with major depression and anxiety disorder. At the time, I was an ordained minister. I was serving in my parents' church. I was traveling, preaching, all of that. But I was, I had these issues that were not being addressed. And I was going to college, I was going to Salisbury University and I had a um, English exam scheduled for that morning. And when I woke up, I had a full blown migraine. I mean, to the vomiting, the whole, all of that, right? So I'm crawling to the bathroom and my head is hurting, my chest is hurting, everything's hurt. My sister was, was with me at the time. She thought I was having a heart attack. So we call the ambulance, they take me to the hospital. They do all kinds of tests. They don't see anything wrong with my heart. Um, they gave me some medicine for the migraine. And just as the doctor got ready to walk out of the area, he, the examination area, he said, so how's Miss Green feeling now? And I said, Miss Green would like to go to sleep and not wake up. Now, what I was thinking was, I need a break. Right. I had a four year old, three, four year old son. I had a teenager who was just starting to act out. I was trying to go to school and work and work in the parents ministry, all of that. I wasn't thinking about suicide. I was thinking about I just need a, a break. Well, that's not what they heard. So I go to sleep, you know, because they give me this medicine for the migraine. When I wake up, there's a woman in a white jacket standing at the foot of the bed and she says hi miss green my name is julie um they asked me to come and talk to you because i understand that you were you have some suicidal thoughts i said what <laughs> i didn't say anything about suicide she said well, what exactly is it that you said i repeated what i said to her she said well how about this the fact that you even want to go to sleep and not wake up, though you may not think that you want to die, but there's so many stressors going on in your life that would even make you say that. So why don't you spend the night and you and I will talk tomorrow and find out, you know, what's going on. Okay, that, was, that sounded wonderful to me because I don't remember the last time I slept through the night. So I'm thinking I don't have to worry about the three-year-old I don't have to worry about the teenager that's out in the street acting like a nut. I can just get some sleep and go home. Well, they didn't tell me that once they admit you to the mental health unit, you have to stay at least 72 hours. <laughs> I, I, I found that out later. So I get admitted. The next morning when I wake up, that's when they tell me I have to stay at least 72 hours because they want to make sure I don't have, that I'm not going to hurt myself or anything like that. What I what I want to um, to express is that even though I'm stuck up here in a mental health unit, right? You know what my biggest concern was? What are people going to think when they find out that I've been admitted up here? My my first thought was not how am I going to get better? What do I need to do to heal? How it was like, oh my God, these people, I hope nobody's up here that knows me. I'll be daggone, I walk into the room where they like, you know, they have a whole team of people there waiting to talk to you. Four people in there I knew from church. 
I just wanted to fall on the floor. I really didn't want to dive in. <laughs> but, but this guy said to me, he said, I can tell from the look on your face exactly what you're thinking. He said, but you would be surprised the number of Christians that come up here. She said, because you hit a wall. You go, you spend all those years pretending you don't feel what you feel, ignoring, like Dr. Brown said, ignoring your molestation, ignoring whatever it is. And then all of a sudden, one day, boom, there you are. And so one of the things, and the reason I brought all that up is because one of the things that I had to learn through my therapy was I too love nature. Because I spent 95% of my time in church, I didn't even realize that I liked nature. And I didn't even realize God was out there. Like, aside from what I read in Genesis about what he created, I didn't even really pay attention that I could encounter God outside church. And so my therapist said to me, take a journal and go to the beach. This is when I was able to, you know, move around like I want to. And I would go down to Ocean City and I would sit and watch the waves and just write in my journal. And I, it just brought such a healing and peace. Mm -hmm. when I, and I think about the creator that made all of these things. So we can experience God anywhere. It is your mindset that has to change. And that's what I heard you saying. And that means so much to me. And what I try to teach people. Because you, you don't let people guilt you and saying you can't encounter God unless you're in church. Mm -hmm. Because God is everywhere. His presence is everywhere. And if you're in tune with that, you can experience God walking in, in the park. Like looking at the, not the ones that get in the road that get on your nerves. I'm talking about the ones that's in the water, not the ones from Canada that think they own the street. I'm talking about the ones that haven't necessarily stay out the middle of the street. No, but there's just so much that we're missing out on. And I wanted you ladies to help bring, shine some light on this that we're just missing out on because we have this rigid way of thinking. And I want us to move beyond that. That's what I wanted to say because I think, and I'm, I'm going to let you ladies go because we started late and that was my fault. But I think that it's important that we understand that our personal philosophy and spirituality also helps us to find the meaning and purpose of life. If anybody um, would like to respond to that statement, feel free to do so. Then we're going to get ready to go. Um, I think I want right to. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I do apologize. I'll let you finish. I was just responding to Kanisha's uh, comment. Um, that she felt like the lady Julie, whose name I will never forget for some reason, uh, imposed her thoughts on me. Like, I wanted a mental break. I didn't want to commit suicide. But, you know, that's her That's her training. You know, that's the question. So that's what she thought. But, um, yeah, so thank you, Kenesha, for that comment because I agree with you on that. All right, Miss Lori, go ahead, sweetie. I just wanted to say, you know, when you're looking at and even dealing with the questions that you had sent me and some statements and really dealing with the mental health, you know, side of it and what the uh, what we have to decide on is that it is OK not to be OK. OK, that's right. And, um, and that's not a sin. That's not wrong. That doesn't take away any of our beliefs. Um, I had an experience just by the fact a few years ago, I had some work done on my front porch and the contractor decided to put a ledge that came out and it was basically something I'm like, okay, I like that, but I really don't like it, but I went along with it. So this year, um, out of the blue, I happened to look up and I noticed these shallows that kept coming in and out and they were the birds and from that moment the sh you know the ledge that i hated the most was really a venue or an opportunity for me to see god and how was that these birds each day kept 
bringing in these little twigs and they were building this nest. And each day they came in out. And there was a couple of days I said, I'm going to knock this thing down because I do not want this <laughs> on my house. I don't want it inside of, you know, the porch area. But something said, no, just watch. So I watched every day. And as they continued to build the nest, my mind again, and it's just like what Dr. Brown said, we don't have to be so spiritual that we take things as being, you know, thou shall and da, 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 da. But it's the simplest things in life that we can see how God is protecting us. And my mind went directly to the scripture and said that if he even thinks about the bird, now here I'm upset and mad about this ledge, not knowing that God was working through me to provide an opportunity for this whole bird family to come develop and grow right on my ledge. But it was showing me if he cares that much for them, he cares for me and he's going to look out for me the same way this ledge was looking out for this whole family of birds. And they end up turning out to be the most beautiful birds. I see them now. They come in, they fly in on the deck. They're red, they're brown, and they're just so beautiful. And for me, that was something so powerful. It may have seemed so simple and small, but yet it let me know, I got you, girl. Why are you worried? Why are you fretting? I really do have you. And the last thing that I want to say, no matter what, we have to take the time to really make time for ourselves. We say it, we tell it to everyone else. All of us are probably leaders and we're busy and we're going, but we have to make sure that we make time, make a date for ourselves. When someone calls me and asks me, can I do X, Y, and Z? I'll look at the calendar. And some days I have to say no. It's not because I have a date with the government. It's not because I have a date at church. It's not because I even have a, a date with a guy. I have a date with Lori. And so at that moment, I am able to say, no, I can't. At six o'clock, I got something scheduled. I don't care if it's just me running around the yard. It's my time. And so we have to learn in order to be mentally strong and to have the capacity. And granted, it's okay not to have capacity sometimes. It's really okay. I can't do it. I'm sorry. It's okay. But take out time, whether it happens to be the walks, if it happens to be riding the lawnmower, if it happens to be plowing in the dirt, if it happens just doing nothing, just make time and don't be afraid to get quiet with yourself because you do deserve it and you owe it to you to do just that. Make sure you're eating right, sleeping, do whatever it takes to make you whole because you're the one at the end of the day that has to be accountable to you. Sometimes we have the saying, I have to be accountable to everybody else. No, it's God in you. Start there first and then maybe you can have the capacity for someone else. But make sure you look out for you and do those things that's essential for you to survive and to make it and to thrive today. I love it. I love it. Thank you so much. Ms. Lisa, did you have any final words? I will say this. I agree with Lori that whole sitting with yourself. So I found my most complete healing is when I sat with myself and learn to listen and to hear, because I think it's such a grave mistake when we look outside of ourselves for answers, that we go chasing people down in prayer lines and all the looking for answers. I believe wholeheartedly, you can't tell me no different, I'm just stubborn in that, in that regards, is that I can hear for myself. And if I learn to sit with myself, and a lot of us don't want to sit quiet, we're scared, absolutely terrified of being alone, absolutely terrified of sitting with ourselves. One, because like, um, the good doctor said, we haven't dealt with our issues. And the moment we sit in silence, all of that starts to come back up, right? Because we haven't dealt with it. And so to all the Ruths out there, to all the young women who may be listening, and then women my same, same age, because there's a lot of healing that needs to be done there. All of us aren't walking in our healing and our wholeness. That's scroll any Instagram page, any Facebook page, but I digress. We have to 
come to this place where we are okay with ourselves. We have to come to this place of healing and we have to initiate it. We have to initiate this healing, right? So there's a saying, and I know it's kind of controversial and it's like, sis, ain't nobody coming to save you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you have to initiate this process, right? Jesus is not coming down and go write the therapist number down in your Bible. That's not going to happen. James Cena, don't laugh at me. Um, but I would encourage you, the first step is getting to know yourself. That has been so written out of us as women is that whole getting to know who you are, getting to hear for yourself, um, getting to know yourself, like yourself, appreciate what you bring to the table. We, we don't know because we've been so groomed for something else, right? To the, for the pleasure of somebody else or to make somebody else happy. And again, to Dr. Lloyd, we don't, we have no, we think self-care is evil. We think self-care is selfish. We think self-care is um, going against scripture when it is the furthest thing from the truth. I tell, I told somebody just recently, it's like, we preach that that scripture, love your neighbor as you love yourself. And it's like, that can't even be done because you even haven't taught me how it is to love myself. We just skip that part altogether. What is it to love? What does that look like? And then maybe we can talk about what loving my neighbor looks like. Once I let me nail the first part and then we can get to the second part. But I think we have been as women, we have been done such a disservice that we aren't taught to here for ourselves or to advocate for ourselves, um, to take care of ourselves. It's always everybody else. And then if there's anything left for you, my husband, I, I love him dearly. He told me, he was like, I, I remember I had been working and doing something for someone else. And he says, let that be the last time that you give somebody your everything. Cause now you don't have anything for you. And it's like, nobody gets a hundred percent of you. I was like, Oh, that's, that's okay, sir. It's like, let me just sit and ponder because I had grown up with that thing. And it's like, you always do, you're always giving, you're always pouring, always pouring. But if there is, if it ain't nothing to pour, sis, there ain't nothing to pour. And it's okay to sit in a space and be poured into, even if you were doing the pouring. And I'll end there. Um, thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> Thank you for speaking. I definitely needed that. And I was listening um, the whole time because uh, my friend has said the same thing to me right before I got on here as far as like, Kathy, you need to slow down and stop doing for everybody. My thing was always stop it. Stop learning. to. I need to start learning to say no and stick with it. Um, doing more self-care piece. That's something I struggle with, but I'm learning to do that more often now. And I yeah, I may have heard, yes, that's selfish, but that's okay. Let me be selfish. My phone goes on D&D &D from six to nine every evening. I have to learn to do that for myself. Um, again, that all comes up with an education piece because we want to have healthy habits where we build relationships, healthy relationships with ourselves and the people that we involve with. So, you know, this was really awesome. It was very enlightening to me to know that I need what I need to do more because of the work that I'm constantly doing. My work is, my phone is on 24 seven. That's why I had to start this D&D &D thing. Let's first start, do not disturb. That's the first start of my, just my piece. You know, um, people will drain you, you know? And I too had to learn, um, I couldn't move forward until I talked. I would talk to, I talked about the domestic violence piece, my story with that, but I couldn't move forward until I talked about the sexual, the molestation. Um, so I kept hearing, you know, God talk to me. I need, it's time. I kept putting it off and putting it off. And a friend of mine, um, my video guy, he does an awesome job. He kind of started backing away from me. I'm like, what is this problem? I need you to take care of this. What is going on? He's like, Kathy. And then we finally hooked back up like two weeks ago. And he was like, God told me to step away from you for a minute because you were doing too much and you're not taking care of yourself. You're always out there. You just need, you need to slow down and find time for yourself. And he said, you need to get to the root of that problem. You need to talk about what it is in order for you to move forward. And I tell you, since I talked about the molestation, I feel a load lifted. I love trees. I love the air. I walk outside in the morning. It's chilly in the morning. I don't even have a sweater on. I'm just, I feel so relieved 
you know, um, and I'm just enlightened by it because it's so much more. Once you get past that hurt, and that pain, everything that has suppressed you so much and people telling you you're not worth it or anything like that, then you start seeing different when you start learning these things that's out here for us, um, you know, to take care of yourself, you know, and it's OK. I used to think being selfish is doing for myself and not anybody else. I used to think that was a sin. So it was like, no, you know, I can't do that. But people had to talk to me, Kathy. It's OK. Because people will run you, like I said. So I had to learn. I'm still going through the process of learning. But I tell you, it does feel good. My phone goes on solid every evening from 6 to 9. It's like I'm in a, I'm on vacation somewhere, you know. But at the same time, it's, you know, if they need, if it's important, leave a message. I'll catch it tomorrow. So, but I do appreciate you ladies wholeheartedly. Everybody says something that I got a piece of and I can take with. Y'all do know that Jesus took moments, right? That's right. I was Jesus say the same moments. thing. <laughs> Jesus took moments. Moments. Absolutely. You have to. You have to. You can't keep poor. That's. You will burn yourself out. It is implausible to think that you can just keep giving and keep giving and never take a moment to replenish. It's. I don't know where that lie came from, and I I I, I long to meet the person who started it because it's like baby. Right. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Because it's very true. And then when we look at this generation who is now dealing with things that we, who of us as Jamie, since she's the um, the youngest one of the group here tonight, um, we won't be talking about her. Um, <laughs> I digress. But anyway, when you look at this generation who is now dealing with social media and the amount of time and effort and what's so involved where they have to, and I believe in, I know there's good content. I know it all has helped. We have all been benefactors of it. Um, but when you constantly look at to see that how they have to run it and what they have to yeah. do and the amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, and again, looking at it from a perspective, I have to keep up with the next person's post. So I got to keep up with the next Every time that I go somewhere, I've got to show something that I am something, that I am doing yeah. something, that I am about something. Mm -hmm. And it does. It, it really becomes um, something that it really becomes mentally draining. Yes, it does. And it's not even what it was intended, even though I think they all hooked us and mm -hmm. uh, they kind of got us all in this. Because in the beginning, it was for people to connect. Um, but now it's more of, you know, all the stresses that come along with it become more of a challenging for so many. And I found out, I was talking to a doctor friend of mine who's now treating people um, for, uh, and I can't, and I'm not going to mess up the name that they call it now, but is actually treating people who are dealing with social um, anxiety. Yes. And it's not even from social, just talking to people. No, it's social anxiety from the constant media of having mm -hmm. to, that they are actually um, mm -hmm. addicted. Mm -hmm. So there's a mm -hmm. lot of things here that we can definitely unpack. And it's very real that if um, people want to be whole, like you're saying, sometimes it's okay just to quiet, be quiet with yourself. It really is. Miss James Cena, I'm going to say this, and I, I thought I was through with my TED Talk, um, but she said some social media. So I've talked to Jamie several times, and I've told her, and it's like, one of the only reasons I'm still on certain platforms is because of her. Mm. It has become such a place of, because I even found myself, and it's like this whole comparison thing is really real, and it does affect your your your, your psyche and your well-being. And so I wholly recommend you know, do when you're doing those Daniel fast, include social media in your Daniel fast. You, there, there should be a time of tearing away or breaking away just so that you can reset because social media, it, it's, it's, it's a whole thing. It is really, it's destroy even our young people. So you've seen the videos of our young, of, of young people who, when they have their devices taken away, yes. they throw these these huge tantrums and they turn violent, right? Because now from the womb, as soon as they get home, it's like they're they're on these devices. And so I would recommend, and it's like if you if you're serious about your healing journey, try a 72 hour fast without your social media. 
No notifications on your phone. Take it off your phone and see what happens. It'll bless your whole life. And then I remember one young lady, um, because there was a period in my life where I was posting everything, every thought that came into my head that I thought that God needed me to share, Um, you know, just pictures, selfies, all the things. And she pulled me to the side and she was like, Lisa, to what end? To 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 what end? And it's like, what? What is the what is the purpose? And so I took a step back. And so my social media pages look quite different than they did maybe 10, 15 years ago, maybe even five years ago, because now it's intentional. What I want to post is intentional. Um, it's thought out. It's not spontaneous all the time. Sometimes it's set out and it's scheduled and talk to I come to Facebook, look for James Cena, post my comments, and then I head off. Um, it's I don't like to play around on Mr. Zuckerberg's um, world too much. Um, that, that, but it has, it really does bring about a healing. So again, if you're serious about your healing journey and your healing process, I would really take a look. If you're an, um, even if you're an Android user, Apple user, it will tell you how much time you're spending on these folks' platforms. Don't be shocked when you when they tally up the time for you. So take take the time, learn to sit in silence and sit with yourself. I recommend journaling um, as a as a getting getting started to healing because again, therapy is still scary for people that look like us, and it's still for somebody else. And I'm I'm so glad to see that part is changing, and I'm happy to see Gen Z. I'm happy to see Gen Alpha. I'm even happy to see millennials embracing therapy in a way that is still kind of tabooish for church folk, for Gen X and baby boomers. And so I am, ha- I'm so happy to see that. So embra- embrace your own healing. You, you have to be intentional about your own healing and start, start with social media. Yeah. Now I'm done with my TED talk. And I do agree with, um, I think Kanisha had made a comment and I do agree. It has been a way that we're able to connect with others, being able to connect with the younger. I just say with everything, it's just like the Bible said, just do it in moderation to do it. And you got to have some type of control. I think that's all we're saying. We're not saying exclude it, throw it away. It has its benefits because guess what? We wouldn't be sitting here tonight having this conversation if it was not there, but it's just like in everything, you got to make sure it doesn't control you, it, you, but you control it. And, um, and I'm going to say this and then I will be done. Um, one of the reasons why that I started the company that I have called Solomon's Financial Solutions is because, again, the very concept and social media has done this. And a lot of my clients are in a financial difficulty, a financial hole, not because of COVID, not because of what happened in 20 in 2008, 2009. But again, because we have the Jonesy mentality and social media has only contributed that more where our people feel like I have to keep up with someone. And financially, it's having a mental, uh, it's taking people on a whole nother journey financially that they really don't have control of. And so it's just, again, as I said, it's having the balance, making sure that we're balancing all that we do. And you know, when you've done something too long, you know, when you've gone overboard, you've got your own triggers, Um, just pay attention and make the adjustment. That's all we're saying. Thank you. Oh, that's very good. (laughs) And, you know, once you unplug from social media, and you do, you know, do that self-evaluation, do a self-assessment and, and check in on you, see where you are. Um, I had to unplug because in 2010, I had an undocumented mental breakdown and I, I had to reset. And in resetting, I had to learn that Social media, I, I I learned to make it so social capitalism. So instead of letting the social media become a negative thing and drain me, I allowed it 
to put me on a platform where it then elevated me. So that's called social capitalism. And because of that, I put a lot of more of my attention on LinkedIn versus Facebook and Instagram. And in doing that, it has opened up platforms for me that my social capitalism has increased. And now I'm an international speaker. So it's taking that, taking, taking what was wrong and making it right. And when you do that, it will cause you to grow and blossom and to understand the true meaning of abundance. Yes, the enemy comes to steal, kill and destroy, but it doesn't stop there. Jesus said, and I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. So instead of just letting social media drain you, learn how to use it as social capitalism. I'm done. <laughs> all right, then. So you all see why um, I, I'm connected with these women because um, the insight and wisdom. Um, I remember somebody, I don't remember who it was, commented on Facebook a few weeks ago that some of us are so addicted to Facebook that you uh, I've been away from him too long now he's he's wanting his nana um that before you he said when you wake up in the morning you roll over and you sign into Facebook you don't even know if you can walk but you will <laughs> you will sign into Facebook and I found I the left because I find myself doing that. Like I was screwed up in the bed, put my pillow behind my neck because y'all know my neck is bad, and starting in to see who responded to a mom's cry or who did. And I said, this is pathetic. So it did become an addiction for me. And so Lisa said to me one day, she when she told me the first time. She said, I don't even sign on here anymore unless I'm checking to see what you're over here doing. <laughs> and then she said, and you need to like take a break. <laughs> and the reason she suggested that to me is because I was becoming so upset by what I was reading or what I was not reading. Every one of you on here, I've had this conversation with every one of you ladies about feeling like I'm giving something that could change lives to people and they're not responding to it. And how can you not see what I'm saying? Like, how can you not feel what I'm saying? And each one of you have said to me in your own way, it's not your responsibility to worry about how they receive it. You just give what the spirit has given you to give. And so I find myself becoming so distressed I would be texting Lisa, calling Lisa, emailing Lisa, like, oh my God, what in the world? How come the people are not? And she said, that's not your business. That's that's not your responsibility. Even Lori, Lori has been a big help with me with the mother's cry. And Lord, Miss Kathy knows I've moaned and groaned to her about I don't know how many times. Like the people who not help me get the school supplies. It happened to the people that were doing and helping me with adopting a family. She said, it's okay. My organization will help you. So I'm wiping snot and saying, okay, thank you. And this is not for me. What in the world are you doing? Like, just give whatever it is that you fell in to get and go on about your business. And so that's why those of you that do watch my page, because I know people are stalking me, you notice that I don't post as much as I used to because I got to worry about me. Right. And so I'm so grateful. Oh my goodness. Okay, hold on one second, ladies. I think Hi, my Jamie girl. Hi, ladies. <laughs> hey, Crystal. I think Crystal got her time mixed up. Yes, I'm on a different time zone. My flight was a little late, but I'm here. <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. We're glad to have you. Um, but we're getting ready to go. But 
before we go, the reason I invited Miss Crystal to be a part of this uh, fantastic group of women, thank you to me. Yes, there is so much diversity in this team. It's unreal. And it just gives you all some insight into the type of women that I am connected to. Because everybody has a whole different background, whole different you know view on life, different experiences. But every one of you have really blessed us today. And I want to say this. I, I invited Crystal. Um, and she did tell me that she would be traveling. And, you know, stuff happens. It's all good. I thank you for even um, checking in at all. Because, you know, you could have very easily said, oh, well, sorry. But before we go, I do want to say one of the reasons that I wanted Crystal to be a part of this uh, roundtable is because I absolutely love the way she loves people. And I love how she, um, her intimate relationship with her husband and her daughter, uh, even her, her babies, she loves, she loves from a place of purity. Like it's not love like, okay, let me love her and see what she can do for me. Plus she brought, she sent me this red lipstick. I think I already licked it all off. <laughs> I think I licked it all off, but she sent me this red lipstick. But I just wanted um, Crystal, because as a wife and a mother uh, of a beautifully successful daughter, and since we're pouring into our daughters tonight, I wanted to ask you just briefly about how did you get to this place where your relationship with your husband, it seems to be like a model situation. And we know it's not perfect because we have two, in, two human beings in a relationship, there's going to be issues. But your relationship with your husband and your daughter is so beautifully successful. And I know that has a lot to do. I watch the way you two interact with each other. And it's a perfect example of the Ruth and Naomi thing that we're talking about tonight. So what is one of the main things that you have found that um, has blessed or has helped you and Jackie's relationship to be as wonderful as it is now? Well, it definitely has not always been wonderful. You know, Jackie is will be 31 next week. And I had to learn. Um, I made the mistake of parenting her like my mother parented me. And unfortunately, I don't have a healthy relationship with my mother. I, I don't have a relationship with my mother. And so I had to learn to break that generational um, curse, so to speak. I had to learn to give myself a little grace. I had to learn how to apologize. And I had to learn to accept my daughter for the choices that she's making as an adult. Um, every choice she makes may not necessarily be my choice, but I had to learn to nurture and support out of a place of love and not out of a place of, this is what I think you should do, or this is what will impress people, or this is what I want my daughter to be. So I guess I, I really had to operate from a place of acceptance, healing, and tolerance. And I think that's what's made our relationship so strong. I love it. Acceptance, healing, and tolerance. Okay. And as we get ready to close out, Crystal, what advice do you give our daughters or the Ruths that are listening to our Naomi wisdom tonight? What advice do you give them? regarding friendships and social circles. Because one of the things, other things I love about you is your social presence, but it's also very um, clear. Like it's not about, you know, people don't have to wonder, well, what is she doing or where is she going or what is her beliefs or how does she feel about certain things? And I see yeah. like your diversity, even with your friends, like, different nationalities, ethnicities, and you're just always doing something. And I'm living like vicariously through you because pretty much I'm just going from the bedroom to the living room. But um, so I'm living vicariously through you. What is uh, a piece of advice that you would give our daughters about building um, friendships and utilizing yeah. their social? I would encourage them to uh, not ignore red flags. I think in any relationship, there are red flags. Uh, when you befriend someone uh, and you, you notice a hint of competition, a hint of envy, 
uh, maybe bad habits. We think that we can change people or um, we ignore those red flags because we want the friendship, we want the company. Those will always come back and bite you. I know that I've been burned by friends. My daughter um, has been burnt by friends as well. And I would encourage daughters to, um, if you don't have a good relationship with your mother, find an adult woman that you do admire, someone you trust. Um, lean on our wisdom. I know daughters think that moms don't, you know, we're old fashioned, we're old school, but really find that female person that you trust. You'd be surprised how much discernment and wisdom that a mature woman will have for a young woman. I love that. You pretty much summed it all up. Everything that we've been talking about tonight, you in that last sentence, you summed it all up because that is exactly what this round table is about, is about sharing our wisdom, pouring into um, our daughters and strengthening them because we want them to have that abundant life that Dr. Brown mentioned earlier. And we want them to not just be so um, competitive and just trying to, you know, compare themselves to being better than somebody else. We want you to find out who you are, love who you are, and be the best version of yourself. Again, I want to thank these beautiful ladies, beautiful inside and out. Oh my God, you don't know how much you all have blessed me tonight. And Crystal, the fact that you checked in instead of just saying, I will text her tomorrow and let her know that I was traveling means more to me than you um, will ever know. I do need some more red, red lipstick though. But um, I got you. <laughs> but Thank I just you love for having me. I'm going to watch. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. And I want to say to those of you who are watching that I want to be able to do a round table, a um, Ruth and Naomi round table like once a month or every other month. And I will contact some other Naomi's that I feel can pour into you as well. And maybe I can get Crystal to come back um, for the next one. But I'm just so I'm just blessed to, to know each and every one of you individually and collectively. You add life to my life. Every one of you knows of my challenges um, health wise and so forth and so on. And chronic sickness, chronic pain affects you mentally and spiritually. And there are days when I just like, I just don't want to do anything. But each one of you encourages me and you don't, when you don't even realize that you're encouraging me. And I appreciate that. Um, and so I want to publicly thank you and to tell you how much I love you. I found out a couple of weeks ago I may be have to have another surgery, which I'm not looking forward to because I have had so many complications with these surgeries. So we're trying to figure out some other things that we can do. Um, but in the meantime, I want to thank you for loving me and encouraging me to keep doing the best I can with what I have. I love you guys. Love you too. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right, I'm getting ready to go. My grandson is steady calling me, calling me, calling me. Thank you all so much for joining. And those of you who all listened in um, tonight, thank you. Miss Lisa um, had to go. But again, I thank you all. You just like have no idea how much you have blessed me. And I will talk to you all soon. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. <laughs>